Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 16th of our Creator's calendar. On this, It's the eighth month, excuse me, which happens to line up with October 26th, 2024 on the Gregorian calendar. <clears throat> and we are continuing with our reading of the Testament of Yahuda this time from the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. Excuse me one moment. So we're continuing with our reading of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. We're currently on the Testament of Yahuda, who was the fourth son of Jacob and Leah, but he was not the fourth one to pass away. As you know, we've been going and trying to go through chronologically. So I believe we'll find this in the end of the text, but he actually passed away when he's 119. Many of his brothers passed away when they were around 125, some of them a little younger, some of them a little older. But without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into this. For anyone that might not remember, Yahuda is those who confess, acknowledge, and praise Yahuwah. And that's what his name represents. Okay? This is the copy of the words of Yahuda. What things he spake to his sons before he died. They gathered themselves together, therefore, and came to him. And he said to them, Hearken, my children, to Yahuda, your father. I was the fourth son born to my father Yaakob, and Leah, my mother, named me Yahuda, saying, I give thanks to Yahuwah, that's Hudula Yahuwah, because he has given me a fourth son, or a fourth son also. I was swift in my youth and obedient to my father in everything. And I honored my mother and my mother's sister. And it, be, and it came to pass, when I became a man, that my father Baruch me, saying, You shall be a king, prospering in all things. Now, I don't know where this is actually written, where Yaakov's saying that to him, but we generally should have had that somewhere. You do have where the promise is given and where it's given to Yahuda. You can see that in the book of Yobelim. There are direct references to it, even in the common scriptures, and how the kingdom over the children of Yisrael was specifically given to the seed or the house of Dawid of Yahuda. <clears throat> so even as you see a selectiveness within the sons of Aharon or within Louis, given the kahuna, and then it goes to Kohath, and then it goes to Amram, and then to Aharon, Moshe, right? But then Aharon gets the kahuna, becomes the high Kohen. And from him, it goes to one son. And then within there, it's a particular branch of the family. And eventually, it leads to 24 families of Kohanim from two of them. So you can see it's selective. And while there's a larger party, it, it keeps being finite. You see the same thing with the kingdom and who it's given to in the course of time through the seed of Dawid. And then even of them, some are rejected and some are chosen in the course of time. And you can read all about that in the Kings and Chronicles and the scriptures that we have. All right, and it says, And Yahuwah showed me favor in all my works, both in the field and in the house. I know that I raced a hind, which is a deer, and caught it and prepared the meat for my father, and he did eat. This is a testament to the, the strength and athleticism of men beforehand, not, not only what we were capable of in yesteryear that only diminishes as time goes on. If anyone's paying attention to the information that was shared by Ron Wyatt about Noah's Ark, the sarcophagus of his wife was 18 feet long. And they weren't considered giants at that time, but they were just larger. <clears throat> it says, and 
the rose I used to master in the chase and overtake all that was in the plains. A wild mare I overtook and caught it and tamed it. I slew a lion and plucked a kid or a baby goat out of its mouth. I took a bear by its paw and hurled it down the cliff and it was crushed. Now, this could be wolf, it might be bear, all right? I can't honestly tell you. The one, and I mentioned that, that it could be because in the scriptures, there's a psalm. I believe it's one of the apocryphal psalms or the Syriac psalms of Dawid that's added and also in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But it mentions how he fought off the bear and the lion in the Masoretic text. But when you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls version, it talks about the wolf and the lion. And the, the wolf has to do with Rome, the lion having to do with the, the kings, right, that it went apostate from Yahuda. And you can see that allusion to throughout Europe. The bear has less significance or meaning in that context. So right here, like I said, this could be a bear. I don't honestly know if it's any different. But when you have the context of a wolf, like if it's in the other one, it could be pertaining to what's right there as well. It says, I outran the wild boar, which was an allusion to Edom, if you remember from the animal apocalypse and the book of Yobelin. It says, I, out I outran the wild boar and seizing it as I ran, I tear it in sunder. A leopard in Hebron leapt upon my dog, and I caught it by the tail, and hurled it on the rocks, and it was broken in twine. I found a wild ox, that's the unicorn of scriptures, right? The KJV version. I found a wild ox feeding in the fields and seizing it by the horns, and whirling it round and stunning it, I cast it from me and slew it. And when the two kings of the Canaanim came sheathed in armor against our flocks and much people with them single-handed i rushed upon the king of hazor and smote him on the greaves and dragged him down and so i slew him and the other the king of tapua as he sat upon his horse i slew and so I scattered all his people. Achor the king, a man of giant stature, I found hurling javelins before and behind as he sat on horseback. And I took up a stone of sixty pounds weight and hurled it and smote his horse and killed it. And I fought with others, or with this other, for two hours, and I clave his shield in twine, and I chopped his off his feet and killed him. Now, this is the exploits of Yahuda who was given to fight the battles of his brethren, like given the kingdom, right? And these are all the fighting, the, the, the campaigns that they had in the land after the incident with Shechem that isn't really mentioned in the scriptures. But this is the part where Yaakov with his bow got his double portion. <clears throat> it says, and as I was stripping off his breastplate, behold, nine men, his companions, began to fight with me. And I, wound, and I wound, rather, my garment on my hand, and I slung stones at them and killed four of them, and the rest fled. And now you can see maybe the illusion of where Dawid got that idea, Right? Or you can see an echo of it played out in his children, in Dawid. And Yaakov, my father, slew Belisath, king of all the kings, a giant in strength, twelve cubits high. I believe it was Goliath that was nine cubits high, right? Which is about, uh, was it six cubits? About nine feet. So this is much taller. And fear fell upon them, and they ceased warring against us. Therefore my father was free from anxiety in the wars when I was with my brethren. For he saw in a vision concerning me, 
that a messenger of might followed me everywhere, that I should not be overcome. And that when he was walking in obedience would have been Mikael, as we see in the Shepherd of Hermas, it's explained slightly in the book of Daniel, but it's expounded on more fully in the Shepherd of Hermas and the visions that he has. Mikael, or the one who is like El, is put over the righteous remnant of his people, of, of Yahushua, our Mashiach's people, while he is off looking for the lost sheep, just as he was put over the world here, right, over the people of his, his father, while he, the father, is laboring for the lost. That's the picture, the, the hand and glove type thing where he's only doing what he sees. It says, And in the south there came upon us a greater war than that in Shechem. Shechem was where Dina was defiled. And in the incident happened with Louis and Shimon and the brothers. It was that that precipitated their warring against the Canaanites until they caused them to cease. It says, and I joined in battle array with my brethren and pursued a thousand men and slew of them two hundred men and four kings. And I went up upon the wall and I slew four mighty men. And so we captured Hazor and took all the spoil. On the next day, we departed to Artain, a city strong and walled and inaccessible threatening us with death. Now, I don't know if it's mentioned, but they're all walled cities and strong defensive cities in Canaan. It was done like that on purpose. Not only is there historical reference for it where you have there the, the beltway between Egypt or Africa and the Middle East. So it's a high traffic area that was highly contested. You had powers that be using that as a gateway between two countries, right? It was always a, a place of importance for that regard only. But <clears throat> um, aside from that, you had the Canaanites were in that land unlawfully. They were doing what they were not supposed to and taking land they, they swore an oath that they wouldn't. So they were all under the curse and given over to Satan. Satan wanted to do everything in his power to thwart the promises, to pervert the seed, to corrupt the truth, to ruin things and muck it up. And the best way he could stop the promises of being fulfilled by having people in the land was to have interlopers guarding it. It's pretty simple, right? And that was part of what was going on here. But you can see it doesn't matter what he tries to accomplish here. There is no power contrary to the will of the Almighty. When he wills a thing, it is done. Nations are nothing before him. This is, But I and Gad approached on the east side of the city, and Reuben and Louis, or Levi, on the west. I say Louis there because the, the wa never made the V sound until modern Hebrew. It's the, the after the Babylonian captivity. I, I don't disagree that that's how it's actually said now. No one can test that. But you go back to the original, and that was never a V sound. The only V came from the bet on occasion, and not always. So, um, as far as I'm aware, the accurate way of pronouncing it, or what he would have said is himself, was Louis, not Levi. But either way, it says, And Reuben and Louis on the west, and... They that were upon the wall, thinking that we were alone, were drawn down against us. And so many, or sorry, and so my brothers secretly climbed up the wall on both sides by stakes and entered the city while the men knew it not. And we took it with the edge of the sword. And as for those who had taken refuge in the tower, we set fire to the tower and took both it and them. And as we were departing, the men of Tapua 
set upon our spoil, and delivering it up to our sons, we fought with them as far as Tapua. And we slew them and burnt their city, and took as spoil all that was in it. So as these ones tried to do, it was done unto them. Okay. And that was administered by the children of Elohim, who are the ones that he gives to do judgment as his threshing sledge, as he mentions in other places. It says, And when I was at the waters of Kezobah, the men of Yobel came against us to battle, and we fought with them and routed them, and their allies from Shiloh we slew. And we did not leave them power to come in against us. And the men of Mekir came upon us the fifth day. Now it says Mekir. Um, Mekir, I don't know what that is down here. I haven't read that yet. But Mekir is the son of Manasseh. And that was not even, that wouldn't have been around this time. So this must, this must be someone else. It says right here. Uh, it says man and Naskir, which would be the Shakir Mani. Okay, so that reads a little bit different. Either way, the men of Makir came upon us the fifth day to seize our spoil, and we attacked them and overcame them in fierce battle. For there was a host of mighty men against, amongst them, and we slew them before they had gone up the ascent. And when we came to their city, their women rolled upon us stones from the brow of the hill on which the city stood. This might be the first mention of that in anything that we'd call scripture or inspired texts. We do have the woman throwing the millstone on someone in a siege against the city mentioned in the scripture, but that happened after this time. So that would have been one of the echoes of this kind of phenomenon. Although here it was against them and did not prosper, but then it was used against the enemy and did. It says, And I and Shimon hid ourselves behind the town and seized upon the heights and destroyed this city also. And the next day it was told us that the king of the city of Gaash, with a mighty host, was coming against us. I therefore and Dan feigned ourselves to be Amorites, and as allies went into their city. <clears throat> the, uh, it mentions your father is a Hittite and your mother was an Amorite, I believe. It, in the psalm somewhere but um they're all related and they they look similar in this area at the time right it says and in the depth of the night our brethren came and we opened to them the gates and we destroyed all the men and their substance and we took for a prey all that was theirs and their three walls we cast down and we drew near to Thamna, where was all the substance of the hostile kings. Then being insulted by them, I was therefore wroth and rushed against them to the summit. And remember, the, the, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of Elohim. Okay, And they kept slinging against me stones and darts. And had not Dan, my brother, aided me, they would have slain me. We came upon them, therefore, with wrath, and they all fled. And passing by another way, they besought my father, and he made shalom with them. And we did to them no hurt, and they became tributary to us, and we restored to them their spoil. Now, there's a lot going on there, but I want you to keep in mind certain things principles in the law and this is something that we have to do as adherence to the common law too whenever you're a judge or a, a jury whenever you're a jury over a man under the common law you are supposed to judicate 
judge them by the law. And it's the equity in the scriptures that we are to do. So like a thief would be given the punishment for thieves accordingly, equitably, with like substance for what rules we do have because not every instance is enumerated, right? It's the same thing in everything right here where it says that you do not do not delight when your enemy falls or he will be lifted up right you don't you don't work righteousness in wrath all these principles in his word you can see playing out in what happened here even though it wasn't completely enumerated beforehand if any of you have been paying attention or if you've read the book of Yobelim, you've seen some of the other testaments before they had the good news they had the the disposition of how they should behave before the Almighty that was pleasing to him. And to do contrary to that was what causes problems. So that was already known. And you can see there's equity in what happened here based on how they were from their heart. And that's something that we should keep in mind because the truth doesn't change. He's trustworthy even when we're not. So this stuff still happens even if we don't give it regard. <clears throat> But it says, And I built Thamna, and my father built Rabiel. I was twenty years old when this war befell, and the Canaanim feared me and my brethren. And I had much cattle, and I had for chief herdsman Aram the Adulamite. And when I went to him, I saw Barsaba, king of Adullam, and he spake unto me, Or sorry, he spake unto us, and he made us a feast. And when I was heated, he gave me his daughter Bathsheba to wife. She bare me Ur, and Onan, and Selah. And two of them Yahuwah smote, for Selah lived, and his children you are. Now, it would have been Selah's children, which I, I want to point out. Selah and all of his children are still children of a Canaanite woman, just like Ur and Onan, and just like it was foretold that all the Canaanite seed would be put under the ban, there is no exception. As you saw with what happened to them, the dispositions of their souls and how they were ultimately in their being. Just like Cain, when he killed his brother and didn't give him seed to be perpetrated or per to continue in the earth, I'm sorry, I'm messing that word up, um, he likewise reaped what he sowed. And all of his seed, not one of them was saved. None of them came to deliverance because it was prevented. As he had done, it was done unto him. And they all died in the flood. So th these are things to keep in mind. And Ob willing, it'll make sense with things that happen later on too. But let's go ahead and continue. Selah, however, was not all of Yahudah's children. He also had uh, the sons of uh, Tamar from Pharez and Zerah, right? It says, And eighteen years my father abode at Shalom with his brother Esau and his sons with us. After that we came from Mesopotamia, from Laban. And when eighteen years were fulfilled, in the fortieth year of my life, Esau, the brother of my father, came upon us with a mighty and strong people. Now, that gives us context. Whether it's exactly 1840, I can't, I can't tell you. But generally, 18 when the wars happened, so that's after they came from Mesopotamia. And he was 40 at the death of his mother. When you find in the book of Yobelim, Esau came up and attacked them. And Jacob smote Esau with an arrow, and he was taken up wounded on Mount Seir. And as he went, he died at Anoniram. And we pursued after the sons of Esau. Now they had a city with walls of iron and gates of brass. And if you remember, you can read in the Proverbs about how a brother contested against is like a, an iron wall and gates of brass, right? But 
in the Septuagint version, it talks about how when you're in unity, you're you're like a defense, and it's not so much antagonistic. But um, things to consider. And then you also have in the foretellers where he's foretelling about Koresh or Cyrus, and he mentions that he goes before him, and he breaks the gates and opens the bars. So there's all different allusions to these kind of things. But this would be the narrative a story where you can see that played out. It says, now they had a city with walls of iron and gates of brass. Right? Remember what the brass and iron represent too. Iron is Rome and brass would be Greece or the Hellenization, right? And we could not enter into it and we encamped around and besieged it. And when they opened not to us in 20 days, I set up a ladder in the sight of all, and with my shield upon my head, I went up, sustaining the assault of stones, upwards of three talents weight. So a talent, remember, is like 70 pounds, I believe, or 75 pounds. And I slew four of their mighty men, and Reuben and Gad slew six others. Then they asked from us terms of shalom, and having taken counsel with our father, we received them as tributaries. Now I want you to look at who's doing the slaying there. Yahuda, which is like the kings of the monarchies of the realms. Reuben, the one who went up into his father's couch and defiled his, his the bed, right? But it's typified in France. And Gad... Right. Gad is the one who is hating his brother, but um, it's typified in Spain and uh, South America. What you have with the Spanish Armada attacking England, like that, it was kind of a picture there. But when these ones rise up against Esau, that's something to keep in mind. And maybe that's part of the... Um, if you guys haven't figured the, that out yet, in Revelation, where it or not even in Revelation, but the ten kings, the ten kingdoms that come up in that beast, and then three of them are uprooted, and then the papacy comes. We've mentioned it before, and you can see this very clearly in the Antichrist for Dummies, where that is during the reign of the papacy in Europe, when the Germanic hordes come in, that's the, the paganized, generally, Hebrews, came in to the belly of the beast, and they sacked pagan Rome, and they broke it into ten Germanic kingdoms. Three of them were uprooted before the temporal power of the little horn came about. That was what was being foretold there. At the end of times, it says that those nations, those kings, will rise up against that woman and burn her with fire. Which is another thing that you see all the way back with Yahuda and what happens to harlots and stuff, which we'll get into at a different time. But I want you to, to see the theme there. And maybe we can start connecting who's the responsible parties for rising up against Esau here, as foretold in our forefathers. <clears throat> it says, Then they asked from us terms of shalom, and having taken counsel with our father, we received them as tributaries. And they gave us 500 cores of wheat, 500 baths of oil, 500 measures of wine, until the famine when we went down into Mitzrayim, or Egypt. All right, and it says, And after these things, my son Ur took to wife Tamar, which is a palm, or a, like a date, or a palm tree. It's the fruit of the palm tree and the palm tree itself, right? This is from Mesopotamia, a daughter of Aram. Now Ur was wicked, and he was in need concerning Tamar, because she was not of the land of Canaan. And on the third night, a messenger of Yahuwah smote him, and he had not known her according to the evil craftiness of his mother, for he did not desire to have children by her. In the days of the wedding feast, I gave Onan to her in marriage, and he also in wickedness knew her not, though he spent with her a year. 
and when I threatened him, he went in under her, but he spilled the seed on the ground, according to the command of his mother, and he also died through wickedness. And I desired to give Selah also to her, but his mother did not permit it, for she wrought evil against Tamar, because she was not of the daughters of Canaan, as she also herself was. And I knew that the race of the Canaanim was wicked. But the impulse of youth blinded my mind. And when I saw her pouring out wine, owing to the intoxication of wine, I was deceived and took her, although my father had not counseled it. Now, remember, he never did anything against what his father said to do, but this he's admitting that he didn't get counsel from his father before making the decision and while i was away she went and took for selah a wife from canaan and when i knew what she had done i cursed her in the anguish of my soul and she also died through her wickedness together with her sons and after these things while tamar was a widow she heard after two years that I was going up to shear my sheep, and I adorned, or sorry, and adorned herself in bridal array, and sat in the city of Enam by the gate. It doesn't tell you how she made to be like a harlot in those times in the scriptures or what we call the Bible, but this is giving you a little more detail for how that was when they were in their um premarital phase here the woman would be dressed as a bride and anyone that wanted could pay the you know pay and have his way with her and that's how she would get a dowry if you will that's what these wicked people would do contrary to the desire of our creator it says i was going up to shear my sheep and adorned herself in bridal array and sat in the city of enam by the gate, for it was a law of the Amorites that she who was about to marry should sit in fornication seven days by the gate. Therefore, being drunk with wine, I did not recognize her, and her beauty deceived me through the fashion of her adorning. And I turned aside to her and said, Let me go up into thee, or into you. And she said, what will you give me? And I gave her my staff and my girdle and the diadem of my kingdom in pledge. And I went in unto her and she conceived and not knowing what I had done, desired to slay her, but she privily sent my pledges and put me to shame. Now, you don't get the context right here, but when we'll look at it in the scriptures, as soon as he finds out that she's pregnant, he says, bring her here and we're going to burn her with fire. You don't have a reference for that anywhere in the Bible for why he would say such a thing. But you can look in the book of Yobelim to get the full context of how that is. And then you can see <clears throat> that that theme, harlotry or harlots are burned in fire, carries all the way through to the end in the book of Revelation. So they could... It's a theme that is literally throughout the entire scripture, but we don't see it so clearly. And that is due for fornication and adultery. Okay, not just a woman, but everybody. That's why everyone that is not of the truth and written in the Lamb's mm -hmm. Book of Life, because they're committing spiritual adultery, they get tossed in the lake of fire at the end. <laughs> This is emerge. I'm sorry. Didn't quite catch that, brother. But if you want to comment, you're more than welcome to. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and continue. And it says, and or I'm sorry, right here. And when I called her, I heard also the secret words which I spoke when lying with her in my drunkenness, and I could not slay her because it was from Yahuwah. 
for I said least haply she did it in subtlety, having received the pledge from another woman. But I came not again near her while I lived, because I had done this abomination in Yisrael. I want you to point out, while this was the seed, his only seed that was perpetuated as a righteous heirs to the throne, none of Selah, none of his children ever ascended to that. Or you can say has a good end, if you will. But he, knowing that that was his son's wife, it was an abomination, and it should not be done. So the fact that it did happen, he didn't give himself license to continue doing evil. He repented, never did it again. And that was attributed to him for righteousness, as you, as we'll see right here. This is, moreover, they who were in the city said that there was no harlot in the gate, because she came from another place and sat for a while in the gate. And I thought that no one knew that I had gone in to her. And after this we came into Mitzrayim to Yahusuf because of the famine. And I was forty and six years old. And seventy and three years lived I in Mitzrayim, or Egypt. Which is two years after Yahusuf. If you remember, he lived to be seventy-one with years ruling with all of his family there. So, Yahuda lived 73 years. Continuing, it says, And now I command you, my children, hearken to Yahuda your father, and keep my sayings to perform all the ordinances of Yahuwah, and to obey the commands of Elohim. And walk not after your lusts, nor in the imaginations of your thoughts in haughtiness of heart. And esteem not in the deeds and strength of your youth, for this also is evil in the eyes of Yahuwah. Since I also esteemed that in wars no comely woman's face ever enticed me, and reproved Reuben, my brother, concerning Bilhah, the wife of my father, the Ruachoth of jealousy and of fornication arrayed themselves against me until... I lay with Bashua the Canaanite and Tamar, who was espoused to my sons. So you see, he, he pointed out the splinter in his brother's eye and failed to remove his plank. Or in another way, he held evil. He did a thing that he wouldn't want done, right? He reproved his brother while glorying or boasting in himself. And then because of such a belief and such an action, these spirits, these demons were arrayed against him and given to overcome him because of what he did. That's the same is for us. I mean, how we be behave, how we act, what we choose to believe, the things that we say have an effect in reality. We can know this through science and a variety of means, but I'm not really interested in all of that and how people look at that stuff. What we should concern ourselves with are the words that he tells us and the things that they mean. You can see here there's a direct consequence with not only your your inner thoughts and the behavior that happens or the intent behind what you do, but it has a double consequence. And you will pay the price for such things, right? I don't know how often we might consider this in the course of our life, but these things are true. And when we abide in his word, even if we're not always correct, if our intentions are right from the heart and we do things as we know to be written, he knows that and he will make it go to a successful outcome, even if we say or do things that are not quite perfect, as explained by Kepha right? So that's encouragement for anyone that's a believer. We might not be there, you know, perfect all the way, but even if we're not, he's compassionate and kind. He's with us and guiding us, uh, even if we're blind or with child, right? Look at all the comforting things that he says and hold to them. If we continue in kindness, we can rely on his kindness. We have that from Shaul himself, right? All right, continuing here, it says, For I said to my father-in-law, 
<clears throat> I will take counsel with my father, and so will I take your daughter. And he was unwilling, but he showed me a boundless store of gold in his daughter's behalf, for he was a king. And he adorned her with gold and pearls, and caused her to pour out wine for us at the feast with the beauty of women. And the wine turned aside my eyes, and pleasure blinded my heart, and I became enamored of, and I lie with her, or lay with her, and transgress the commandment of Yahuwah and the commandment of my fathers, and I took her to wife. And Yahuwah rewarded me according to the imagination of my heart, inasmuch as I had no joy in her children. And that might seem like it's harsh, but I want you to consider, if you knew, you saw that two of your sons had died, right? He, had, he lived through all that horror, and then you knew what was in store. How could you be joyful? That's what he had to suffer for his choices there. He says, And now, my children, I say unto you, Be not drunk with wine, for wine turns the mind away from the truth and inspires the passion to lust, and leads the eyes into error. For the Ruach of fornication has wine as a minister to give pleasure to the mind. For these two also take away the mind of man. For if a man drink wine to drunkenness, it disturbs the mind with filthy thoughts, leading to fornication, and heats the body to carnal union. And if the occasion of the lust be present, he works the sin and is not ashamed. Such is the inebriated man, my children, for he who is drunken reverences no man. For behold, it made me also to err, so that I was not ashamed of the multitude in the city, in that before the eyes of all I turned aside unto Tamar and wrought a great sin and I uncovered the covering of my son's shame. After I had drunk wine, I reverenced not the commandment of Elohim, and I took a woman of Canaan to wife. For much discretion needs the man who drinks wine, my children, and herein is discretion in drinking wine. A man may drink so long as he preserves modesty, but if he go beyond this limit, the ruach of deceit attacks his mind, and it makes the drunkard to talk filthily and to transgress and not be ashamed, but even to esteem in his shame and to count himself honorable. He that commits fornication is not aware when he suffers loss and is not ashamed when put to dishonor. For even though a man be a king and commit fornication, he is stripped of his kingship by becoming the slave of fornication, as I myself also suffered. For I gave my staff, that is, the staff of my tribe, which was the, the staff of the leader, if you will, all the rods that were given and the rod of Aharon being budded, that was his staff. Same picture here. And my girdle, that is, my power, and my diadem, that is, the esteem of my kingdom. And indeed, I repented of these things. Wine, he, he repented, and now he's telling you how. Wine and flesh, I ate not until my old age. Nor did I behold any joy. And the messenger of Elohim showed me that forever do women bear rule over king and beggar alike. And that is also seen in, I believe it's 3rd Esdras or 2nd um, Ezra, they call it, or 3rd Ezra, if you will, where it has Zerubbabel and the other men going before Darius, I believe, and he gives them who is the greatest. And they all come up with their own answers. One says wine is the greatest. One says women are the greatest. And one says the truth. Or sorry, one says wine. 
one says the king and the other says women and the truth bears witness or rule over all. And that one is the one that won out. <clears throat> so there's an illusion there about this very thing. And I highly encourage you to read that. It's, it's very interesting there. It says, and from the king, they take away his esteem and from the valiant man, his might and from the beggar, even that which little, which is the stay of his poverty. Observe, therefore, my children, the right limit or the limit in wine. And that's why it's not for sovereigns to drink strong drink, right? Lemuel's giving those uh, admonishments from his mother in Proverbs 31. It says, for there are in it four evil spirits of lust, of hot desire, of profligacy, of filthy lucre. If you drink wine in gladness, be you modest with the fear of Elohim. For in gladness, the fear of Elohim departs. Sorry, for if in gladness, the fear of Elohim departs, then drunkenness arises and shamelessness stills in. But if you would live soberly, do not touch wine at all, lest you sin in words of outrage and in fightings and slanders and transgressions of the commandments of Elohim, and you perish before your time. So those are all things that are equated to what drunk people do. Words of outrage, fightings and slanders, transgressions in the commandments of Elohim. So you don't want to act like you're drunk behaving that way while pretending to be sober, right? Or actually being sober, that'd be even worse. It says, moreover, wine reveals the mysteries of Elohim and men, even as I also revealed the commandments of Elohim and the mysteries of Yaakov, my father, to the Canaanite or the Canaanim woman, Bathsheba, which Elohim bade me not to reveal. And wine is a cause both of war and confusion. And now I command you, my children, not to love money, nor to gaze upon the beauty of women, because for the sake of money and beauty I was led astray to Bathsheba, the Canaanim. For I know that because of these two things shall my race fall into wickedness. For even wise men among my sons shall they mar, and shall cause the kingdom of Yahudah to be diminished, which Yahuwah gave me because of my obedience to my father. For I never caused grief to Yaakov, my father, for all things whatsoever he commanded, I did. And that's what gave him the kingdom. If you hadn't, we haven't really gone into this too much, but we will. And for anyone that wants to know, there's a, a pretty interesting series on YouTube. I'll go ahead and link in the description. But um, of all the people sharing his word in the messianic community, if you will, or believers that know that we have to do more than just lip service, there's only two other individuals that I know of that are connecting the dots between the history of these people and the scriptures and the actual descendants of them with the uh, people of the world today and where we are. One of them goes into great detail about the covenants and the promises given and how that played out in the children and the infighting and problems and the, it, the echoes it causes through history. And I'll share his information uh, in the description because he, he goes into detail about these things. And I don't think he's familiar with any of the Testaments or anything outside of the Bible, but he does a very well, it does an amazing job of showing the same facets without all these extra things pointed it out very clearly. Um, or in such great detail. So I will, I'll share that with you, and I think it's edifying, but you can see another example of these things from a different perspective, and perhaps that'll help you. But right here, um, he's foretelling, for even wise men among my sons, they shall mar, meaning alcohol and women. And you have that example at least with the um, 
with the woman part, both in Dawid and in Shalomo. There might be other examples as well. But if you have a propensity to anger issues, to being, uh, you know, to things that be might be of Gad or might be of one or the other, you can see it in what they're admonishing their children and how you can see how your life has been. If you have issues with alcohol and women, for example, or in positions of authority and having corruption and such, that would more than likely fall under Yahuda here, to which he's trying to admonish his children not to be partaking of these things. All right, so right here it says, And Yitzhak, the father of my father, Baruch me to, the, to be king in Yisrael, and Yaakov further Baruch me in like manner. We find that Baraka where Yitzhak gives him the kingdom right after he gives Louis the kahuna in the book of Yobelim, where they had returned from Padan Aram, from Armenia and Laban, and they were keeping the feast in the seventh month and trying to keep Yaakov's vow. We will be reading that. We've already gone through Bereshit, but you don't see any of that playing out with the keeping of the feasts or the kingdom and the kahuna going to them in what we call the Bible. All of that is really silent on that part, but you find it in detail in the book of Yobelim, and it helps to establish the pattern of what would come later that you can see very clearly if you've been paying attention to those things. Says, and I know that from me shall the kingdom be established, right? And then right here it says, For I have also read in the books of Hanok the righteous, what evils you will do in the last days. Beware, therefore, my children, of fornication and the love of money, and hearken to Yahuda your father. For these things withdraw you from the law of Elohim and blind the inclination of the soul. Okay. So fornication and love of money are two things that, that blind the inclination of the soul. Another thing that causes spiritual blindness is idolatry, which is also equated to idolatry and adultery. Right, anything that put you put before his words or the commandments that he said not to do, it gives the demons jurisdiction to muddy up your senses, and these are explained in this way. But this is why he tells us not to do that because if we abstain, they literally have no jurisdiction. So it says, for these things withdraw you from the law of Elohim and blind the inclination of the inner being, and teach arrogance, and suffer not a man to have compassion upon his neighbor. They rob his inner being of all goodness, and oppress him with toils and troubles, and drive away sleep from him, and devour his flesh. And he hinders the sacrifices of Elohim, and remembers not the Baraka of Elohim. He hearkens not to a foreteller when he speaks, and resents the words of righteousness, for he is a slave to two contrary passions, and cannot obey Elohim, because they have blinded his inner being, and he walks in the day as in the night. My children, the love of money leads to idolatry. Right there he tells you. And idolatry, which is spiritual adultery, blinds you. Just like I just mentioned, you can find that in Psalm 115, Psalm 135. There is a section in the Hok Mishalomo. There is an epistle in Baruch that's from Yahu to those that are in Babylon about idolatry and staying away from them. It is literally everywhere. But you can see love of money, putting something else over it, where he says don't do such a thing over his word is also idolatry. It says, because when led astray through money, men name as mighty ones those who are not mighty ones. 
and it causes him who has it to fall into madness. This might not make sense to people, but it mentions elsewhere that the one who's got a lot of money is deprived of his sleep because of it. They have to set guards for it. They, they, they have other issues. They can't just be content or at shalom. It, they fall into madness, he calls it here. For the sake of money, I lost my children and had not my repentance and my humiliation and the prayers of my father Yaakov been accepted. I should have died childless. But the Elohim of my fathers had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance. And the prince of deceit blinded me, and I was ignorant as a man and as flesh, being corrupted through sins, and I learnt my own weakness while thinking myself invincible. See, now, he knowingly, he knew that he wasn't supposed to marry a Canaanite woman, but he did it anyways when he was drunk. And he still says that he was forgiven because it was in ignorance that he did it. That might seem contrary to people, but as I've tried to explain, he equates that anyone who does not truly fear the future judgment to come is ignorant of it being real. If you really knew that it was existent, you would really never do anything that would cause you to go there, period. And it's through ignorance of the fact, not because you couldn't know, but because you, you don't, ignorant. It's because of ignorance of that fact that you that anyone does sin. If you know the future judgment, you will know not to do a thing. That, that's the thing that he has in mind. And that is consistent with what you can read in the recognitions, plain word for word almost. It says, and the prince of deceit blinded me, and I was ignorant as a man and as flesh, being corrupted through sins, and I learnt my own weakness while thinking myself invincible. Know therefore, my children, that two spirits, or Ruach Oath, weighed upon man. And this is one of many sections throughout the word that talk about the two Ruach Oath, the prince of righteousness, Melchizedek, and, or the king of righteousness, and Malki Rasha, the king of evil, the prince of light, Yahushua, and the prince of darkness, Satan. Right. This is the spirit of truth and the ruach or spirit of deceit. And in the midst of the spirit of the comprehension of the mind to which it belongs to turn whithersoever it will. So you have the ruach of truth and the ruach of deceit and in the midst of them is your comprehension, the comprehension of your mind to which you can turn it to whichever you desire. That very phenomenon is what we will read here shortly after we're done with the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs here. You have the Testament of Kohath, the father of Amram, the father of Aharon, Miriam, and Moshe. And then you have the visions of Amram their father, and in his visions he saw the Malkirasha and Melchizedek fighting over him, and he was told to choose whichever he would to rule over him. It says, And the works of truth and the works of deceit are <clears throat> written upon the hearts of men, and each one of them Yahuwah knows. And there is no time at which the works of men can be hid, or on the heart itself have they been written down before Yahuwah. And the Ruach of truth testifies all things, and accuses all, and the sinner is burnt up by his own heart, and cannot raise his face to the judge. And now, my children, I command you, love Louis, that you may abide and not exalt yourselves against him, lest you be utterly destroyed. For to me, Yahuwah gave the kingdom, and to him, the kahuna. And that's another thing I wanted to mention. The birthright, the original passed down, it, it can it contain the double portion, which is always meant for the kinsman redeemer. The double portion of the firstborn is not so that they can have more than the rest of their, their brethren just because, but to redeem them in need. 
if they have to, to be a responsible party to help his brethren when their father is gone. That That's what that's about. So the kinsman redeemer is that idea. But that was given to Yahuda as the king, right? In the king position, while the double portion and the one who's been benefiting his brethren in places when they come to prominence went to Yahusuf, specifically to the two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, the great company of nations and the great nation, if you will, right? Who use their double portion to benefit others, if you can see the picture there. That is what's gone over in detail by what that gentleman shares. I'm sorry I didn't mention that in um like I was meant or like I was meaning to. But um the firstborn portion, the double portion inheritance, the kingdom and the kahuna was all supposed to go to Reuben, who defiled his father's bed, and it was skipping him. And then Shimon, in what he did with the uh, Shechem, incurred his father's heir, and he was passed over. From there, it would go to, as he'd wanted, to go to Yahusuf. And while the double portion did, our creator would not allow what was rightfully the allotment of firstborn status to leave who it belonged to. The third in line got the kahuna, which is the greatest portion. It was like the sun, as we'll see in other places. It is considered the better portion of all of them. The next in line, the fourth who never upset his father, got the earthly kingdom. And while this was esteemed more in Yaakov's eyes, Louis got the better portion. And it wasn't because his father gifted it to him. It was because it, it was given by our creator when he also found disfavor by his father with what had happened. It, you guys just remember we had recently read that. But I'm trying to show you here the birthright, the firstborn's birthright was actually split and broken up into different sections. The gentleman mentions this specifically in regard to the kingdom and the double portion. And you can see where it was taken from Reuben and given to Yahusuf. And you can see where the kingdom landed to Yahuda. But you, it's he doesn't mention the kahuna or the priesthood itself. But you can see it here. And you can see the order of how things pass down more clearly when you look at when you look at it in that context. So the ones that were worthy got re got the portions as they saw fit, as he as our creator willed, and yet with the intent to, an, to a limit of the men that are involved. Something that we should keep in mind when we're praying or hoping for things. It might all, not always be the way we desire, but it'll still be to the benefit of the one we're praying for. Another example of this is in Abraham praying and interceding for Yishmael when Yahuwah tells him that Yitzhak will be his promised seed. He says, let, let Yishmael live before you. And he says, I've heard your voice, and he too will be a great nation. Twelve nations will come from him, and I will bless him, and he will be a multitude. But in Yitzhak is the promise. So, same kind of picture. <clears throat> this is, for to me, Yahuwah gave the kingdom, and to him the kahuna. And he set the kingdom beneath the kahuna. To me he gave things upon the earth, to him the things in the Shamayim. As the Shamayim is higher than the earth, so is the kahuna of Elohim higher than the earthly kingdom. Unless it falls away through sin from Yahuwah and is dominated by the earthly kingdom. For the messenger of Yahuwah said unto me, Yahuwah chose him rather than you to draw near to him, and to eat of his table, and to offer him the first fruits of the choice things of the sons of Yisrael. But you shall be king of Yaakov, and you shall be amongst them as the sea. Something to keep in mind, especially when you consider the uh, hocus pocus that goes on tricky word games and the, the law of the land, the law of the air, the law of the sea, the, the holy sea and all of that, how it ties into these things, okay? Because it is the monarchs of the that give power to that little horn, just as it mentions in Revelation. This is how it's done, and these are the ones through whom it's done. 
says, And you shall be amongst them as the sea. For as on the sea, righteous and unrighteous are tossed about, some taken into captivity while some are enriched, so also shall every race of men be in you. Some shall be impoverished, being taken captive, and others grow rich by plundering the possessions of others. For the kings shall be as sea monsters. They shall swallow men like fishes. And like the emissaries came as fishers of men, right? The sons and daughters of free men shall they enslave. Houses, lands, flocks, money shall they plunder. And with the flesh of many shall they wrongfully feed the ravens and the cranes. And this is just a testament to how kings have mistreated people through ages. It's the truth. Right? And they shall advance in evil, in covetedness, uplifted. And there shall be false foretellers like tempests. And they shall persecute all righteous men. And Yahuwah shall bring upon them divisions, one against another. Where even in the house of Dawid, his children are fighting against each other right? And there shall be continual wars in Israel, and among men of another race shall my kingdom be brought to an end, until the deliverance of Israel shall come, until the appearing of, Elo of the Elohim of righteousness, that Jacob and all the nations or Gentiles may rest in Shalom. And he shall guard the might of my kingdom forever. For Yahuwah swear to me with an oath that he would not destroy the kingdom from my seed forever. And that promise is perpetuated through the seed of Dawid, where it was literally sworn to Dawid by the set-apartness of the Almighty that his seed would be forever. And his, in his throne, what, as the sun before him? Right, And as the moon, it is established forever. So we've talked about that before, how the phases of the moon ties in with the kingdom. And you can see that in the genealogy of our Mashiach from Abraham to Dawid, from Dawid to the, to the Babylonian captivity, and from the return to the coming of our Mashiach. Right? But um, this is also legitimizing the book of Tetaphi, and the fact that the literal seed of Dawid was brought by Yirmiyahu to Ireland, where she married the son of Zerah. And while the Pharez line was diminished, the Zerah line was exalted. All foretold in is, is Yehezkiel or Ezekiel, Yeshiyahu. And in that book, you can see it played out. <clears throat> but that is also the, the truth of his seed reigning over the children of Israel even to this day because they're over the monarchs of, of England are over the children. The monarchs of Europe are over the children. Not all of them, but the ones to whom they're given and they are doing the things and getting the government that they deserve, just like we are. This is... Now I have much grief, my children, because of your lewdness and witchcrafts and idolatries which you shall practice against the kingdom, following them that have familiar spirits, diviners, and demons of error. You shall make your daughters singer, singing girls and harlots, and you shall mingle in the abominations of the Gentiles." For which things sake, Yahuwah shall bring upon you famine and pestilence. Think of the, the plagues and things that have gone on through the Dark Ages. Those are also explained in the book of Revelation because of the persecutions against believers. But it's his own children doing that against his own children. Just like you see in the children fighting against Yahusif in the land there, right? It says, Yahuwah shall bring upon you famine and pestilence, death and the sword, beleaguering by enemies and revilings of friends, the slaughter of children, 
the ravaging of wives, the plundering of possessions, the burning of the Hekel, excuse me, of Elohim, the laying waste of the land, the enslavement of yourselves among the Gentiles, and they shall make some of you eunuchs for their wives, just as happened to Yahusuf. He was like the kinsman redeemer. Remember all the things that happened to him and his children that he would, that they got put on Yahuda after our Mashiach came. They were cast out, right? And everything that happened to them, like the scapegoat as the kinsman redeemer type picture. It's another thing about Yahuda and the other tribes. They were known, they were diminished and not, and not prospering. The others were not known and they had their own benefits. You can see it clearly in the scriptures and all willing as we get to them, we'll, we'll point them out. But there are many books written on these topics from the 1800s on that are very in-depth about all of that. Singing girls, like tavern girls, if you will. It, not, not something that's honorable. All right, it looks like we'll read right here. It, there's two different versions, but this one seems to have a little more. It says, Until you turn unto Yahuwah with perfect heart, repenting and walking in all the commandments of Elohim, and Yahuwah visit you with mercy and bring you up from captivity among the Gentiles. It says, And after these things shall arise or shall a star arise from, or to you from Yaakov in Shalom, and a man shall arise from my seed like the son of righteousness, walking with the sons of men in meekness and righteousness. So you see that part's missing from that version. And no sin shall be found in him, directly speaking of our Mashiach, and that's also missing from this other version you see. There's another, there's another psalm, it's called the Psalm of, um, the Psalms of Shalomo and the Odes of Shalomo. They say that neither one was written by him, and the Odes tend to have in them the context that it was written by a new covenant believer that was a Gentile that came into the belief. But the odes are from before those times. And in one of them is, uh, I believe it's number 17. It's a huge one that is about the messianic era of our Mashiach and what he's going to do. And it mentions directly that he has no sin. So it's two places there before he came that directly talks about that. And the Shemaim shall be opened unto him to pour out the Ruach, even the Baraka of the Kodesh Father. And he shall pour out the Ruach of favor upon you. And you shall be unto him sons in truth. And you shall walk in his commandments, first and last. This branch of El Most High, so this branch of El Elyon, and this fountain, giving life unto all. Both allusions to our Mashiach, right? Then shall the scepter of my kingdom shine forth, and from your root shall arise a stem, and from it shall grow a rod of righteousness to the Gentiles, to judge and to deliver all that call upon Yahuwah. And after these things shall Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov arise unto life, and I and my brethren shall be chiefs of the tribes of Yisrael, Louis first, I the second, Yahusuf the third, Benjamin fourth, Shimon fifth, Yishakar sixth, and so all in order. And Yahuwah Baruch Louis, and the messenger of the presence, me, the powers of esteem, Shimon, the Shamayim, Reuben, 
the earth, Yishakar, the sea, Zebulun. And if I remember correctly, Yishakar is the one that became a good farmer. Zebulun was the one that had made a sailing vessel and was prominent in fishing, had the foretellings of being uh, a place of harbor, which we would know as Holland, right? But the mountains, Yahusuf, America and the United Kingdom there, but the mountains are also kingdoms where you have a nation and company of nations, but literally the, the land of a thousand hills is alluding to America, right? The tabernacle, Benjamin, who is at the right hand and the temple and the tabernacle is in his portion. The luminaries, Dan, Eden, Naphtali, the sun, Gad, the moon, Asher. And you and there might be significance to all these things in the order they're given and what's pointed out. I'm just pointing out things that stick to my mind clearly and they, they popped out at me there. If you guys can think of anything else, please do share, right? But it says, and you shall be the people of Yahuwah and have one tongue. That's mentioned also in Gad the seer again, and Zeph and Yahu, uh, it shall be returned unto one lip, right? And there shall be, or, and there shall be there no ruach of deceit of worthlessness, for he shall be cast into the fire forever. And they who have died in grief shall arise in joy, and they who were poor for Yahuwah's sake shall be made rich. And they who are put to death for Yahuwah's sake shall awake to life. And the hearts of Yaakov shall run in joyfulness. Now these are the, the deer, okay? The hearts. And the eagles of Yisrael shall fly in gladness. The, the picture there, the eagles, we know about more like American, what flies and soars on the wings. You, you have pictures, the, the, the eagles of Yisrael. You have the different eagle countries that that might represent, right? But the hearts, there's animal standards or heraldry too. But the picture here is not so much, um, it's not a cattle. They're not domesticated in herds. It's it's typified before the Reformation, before the, the cattle that were created in that parable on the sixth day. You had the deer and the wild ones where they were, clean animals, but they were not necessarily together. They were considered wild and almost like they were unclean. That's talked about in different places and alluded to, but it's the picture right here of certain times in history that is being pointed out. And Father Willing will be able to see these more as time goes on. But it lines up with the things of when they were created and what it represents. It says, and all the peoples shall esteem Yahuwah forever. Observe, therefore, my children, all the law of Yahuwah, for there is expectation for all them who hold fast unto his ways. And he said to them, Behold, I die before your eyes this day, a hundred and nineteen years old. Let no one bury me in costly apparel nor tear open my bowels, for this shall they who are kings do. And like embalming, right? They go through expensive ceremonies and things to preserve their bodies and be buried with a whole bunch of stuff. And he says, don't do that. Don't do that for me. There's another place that mentions that kings are buried with treasures only to be plundered. And you find that that's literally true through history. It's pretty much all that's happened to them. Even even Dawid, his sepulcher is mentioned to be containing a vast amount of wealth, and it was opened up and used on occasion, as necessity dictated. It says, And carry me up to Hebron with you. And Yahuda, when he had said these things, fell asleep, and his sons did according to all whatsoever he commanded them, and they buried him in Hebron with his fathers. All right, thank you very much. Um, I believe that, I'm surprised we actually got through it all. Uh, I'm happy about that, but 
I thought this one was going to be a little bit longer. Louis definitely will be because it's the longest of all of them. We actually have a more full version of it because almost a complete copy was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you can really see a contrast between what we have that came down in the Greek and then what was found that was buried. There's one part that is just a sentence in the Greek that's an entire paragraph or more in the other version because it actually gives you the detail about it instead of just summarizing. So it's a little bit of what we might be missing in all of these things that you have to be keep in mind, keep an open mind, and to be uh, patient with our, allow our creator to teach us as he will. But thank you all for your time. You have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and a Shavuot Tov, a great week ahead, and we will talk to you next time. Shalom.